All right, so this chapter is called Conjugated Dienes. And the first thing that we did was we learned how to look at the structure of a diene and classify it as either isolated, cumulated, or conjugated. So for these two up here, what would the one on the left-hand side be? Isolated, cumulated, or conjugated? Conjugated. So this is really our focus for this chapter is this type of bond right here are conjugated dienes, okay? And again, I know it's a conjugated diene because I have these sp2 hybridized carbons all in a row. I have this perfect spacing where my bonds go double bond, single bond, double bond. Uh, what about the one on the right? This one would be isolated. And I can tell that it's isolated because I got this sp3 hybridized carbon in the middle here effing everything up, all right? Breaking the ability for that one bond to talk to that other double bond, okay? And like we said, and I did this terrible drawing here, the reason that we have this conjugation is because each one of these carbon atoms has this p orbital, that's where pi bonding takes place, and these electrons can kind of move between that whole network of p orbitals. When you have an isolated double bond, I'm sorry, an isolated diene, these electrons in this pi bond can't talk to these electrons in this pi bond. Okay, so again, the electrons in a conjugated diene are going to kind of spread themselves out across that double bond network. Um, the textbook obviously has a way better ability to show this than my crappy drawings. All right. So what we can see for our conjugated diene is we got a bunch of electron density in this region right here, right? That's corresponding to those electrons spreading themselves out. We don't see that in our isolated diene. Again, we got that sp3 hybridized carbon that's messing everything up, breaking that conjugation. All right, cool. So. Uh, today, we're going to talk about reactions of conjugated dienes. All right, we've got two reactions of conjugated dienes we're going to worry about. Um, I'm going to kick the can on one of those down the road until next Monday, what are called Diels alder reactions. We'll introduce those on Monday. Today we're going to strictly focus on what are called electrophilic addition reactions. Okay, we can even be more specific. Electrophilic addition of a hydrohalogen. Okay, and by that I mean HBr or HX, right? Something with that formula H and then a halogen. Okay, so first of all, let's just remember that alkenes undergo what we call addition reactions. Okay, so for example, and we'll just use a hydrohalogen here. What's going to happen is we're going to break our double bond, break that pi bond, and on either side, we're going to add the atoms of our reagent. So in the case of HCl, we add an H to one side and a Cl to the other side.
And when you study alkenes, you saw a lot of different addition reactions. They all followed this same basic format, right? Where you're adding something to both carbons in that alkene. Okay? So specifically to these hydrohalogenation reactions of alkenes, they had this funky property, which was named after this Russian dude. These are Markovnikov additions. We take an alkene, like pentene, uh, propene rather, and we do our hydrohalogenation reaction. In theory, we could get two different products depending on which side we added the hydrogen to and which side we added the halogen to. Okay, so if I add, I'm going to color these carbons here. If I add my hydrogen to my orange carbon and my chlorine to my green carbon, I would get the one chloropropane. And if I did the opposite, I added the chloro group to the uh, second carbon, the orange carbon, and the hydrogen to the green carbon, I would get the two chloropropane, right? So I could get these two possible products. But what you learned is that only one of these products will form what we call a Markovnikov addition here. So which one do we get? Does anybody remember the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right, a Markovnikov addition meant that that Cl gets added to the more substituted carbon. I guess you could say halogen. Okay, great, but why? Why was this reaction a mark? That's a helpful little thing to remember so that you draw the product correctly, but there's this very important why question that we have, right? Why was it a Markovnikov addition? And 99% of the time when we're talking about the why in organic chemistry, the explanation is the reaction mechanism, right? The mechanism of the reaction tells you why that reaction uh, proceeded the way that it did. So let's look at our mechanism here. By reaction mechanism, I mean I need those electron pushing arrows. All right? We also have some terminology that we haven't thrown around yet this semester because we haven't really talked about uh, specific reactions. In a chemical reaction, our nucleophile is the thing that really wants a nucleus, a positively charged nucleus. So these are our electron-rich species in this reaction. Okay, when we do our mechanism, they will be at the base of our arrow, the pair of electrons doing the attacking. And nucleophiles attack electrophiles. All right, electrophiles is a lover of electrons. This is something that is electron poor. It doesn't have a lot of electrons, that's why it wants them. Okay, and this will be at the head of the arrow. All right, so when we do our reaction mechanism for our HBr here, or for our hydrohalogenation, 
that first step is this arrow right here. So what is playing the role of the nucleophile in this reaction? The double bond, yeah, specifically that pi bond, right? We talked about the geometry of that pi bond, that pair of electrons sitting above that molecule can reach out and grab that hydrogen. So then the electrophile is my hydrohalogen, specifically the ha uh, hydrogen, that acidic hydrogen. Cool, and we gotta break that bond. Let's be good and put in our lone pairs as well. Okay. So we talked about this pattern that we see when double bonds are playing the role of nucleophiles. This is this bond breaking and formation sort of pattern. And we will get this carbocation intermediate. Okay, but again, if my hydrogen gets added over here, my carbocation would form in the middle. Or my hydrogen was added to that middle carbon, I get this carbocation on the end here. And the reason why we get a specific product in this reaction is because of this intermediate right here, this carbocation intermediate. One of these is way more stable than the other one. Okay. Which one is the more stable carbocation, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left, all right? So the more substituted our carbocation, the more stable it is. So let's remind ourselves, we're going to make this little chart of carbocation stability. Where the least stable would be a methyl carbocation, followed by a primary, then a secondary, and the most stable carbocation in terms of classification of carbons would be that tertiary carbocation. All right, we're going to add to this list here, so I'm going to leave some space over here. This is the most stable. So again, methyl is the worst, followed by a primary, secondary, and finally a nice, stable tertiary carbocation. These are greater than symbols, even though they don't look like it. All right, so when we look at those intermediates, we're comparing a primary carbocation to a secondary carbocation. Well, the secondary carbocation is much more stable, and thus that's going to be our intermediate in this reaction. That's where that carbocation is going to form. All right? So the reason why we have that Markovnikov addition is because now my chloride ion, now it's the electron-rich species going to attack that electron poor carbocation and that's how we get our Markovnikov product. Okay. Cool, so what we're gonna see for our conjugated dienes is gonna be something very, very similar, just with a little bit of an added twist to it because now we got that second double bond in the mix. But we're gonna st uh, see a mechanism that is very similar to what we see here. Okay, so now let's do one with our conjugated diene. We're gonna do one, three butadiene here.
be good in title. This is our reaction mechanism for a conjugated diene. So first step is the exact same. We have our, elect our nucleophilic double bond attacking that hydrogen. That'll break that bond there. So again, we're going to have this carbocation intermediate. Okay, our carbocation intermediate We'll have the carbocation in this position right here, right? This is my stable carbocation intermediate. And I think everybody's going to look at this and say, ah, yes, because that's the more substituted carbon. So that's why that's the most stable, okay? It actually has to do with the double bond, the position of the other double bond. Because it turns out in our stability of carbocation, there is something all the way over here that is even more stable than a tertiary carbocation. And that is what we call an allylic carbocation. An allylic carbocation means that it is one removed from a double bond. This is what we call an allylic carbon. So allylic, I guess just to be good and kind of remember the origins of this here. So we have an alkene. We call the carbons about that double bond the vanillic position. And the positions one removed from those double bonds are what we call the allylic positions. These are the ones bound to the sp2 carbons. It's not the sp2 carbon itself, right? Not the thing that's on the double bond, but right next to it. These carbocations are super duper stable. They're way more stable than our other carbocations. So it actually doesn't matter which one's the more substituted carbon. In this case, it does happen to be this carbon right here. But even if this was the less substituted carbon, the carbocation will always form on the allylic position. Okay, so it's the same argument, but we got to look at something a little bit different. We're st still looking for the most stable carbocation. But again, it will form on the allylic position. Okay, I'm going to reorganize this a little bit. Cool. So then now, everybody take a second. Here's my chloride ion. Finish this reaction mechanism and tell me what you think the product of this reaction is going to be. So our electron-rich species, our nucleophile, is going to do what nucleophiles do and attack this electrophile. Remember, the base of your arrow has to be on a pair of electrons. The head of your arrow is at an atom. Okay, so now my chloro group will be right here. Uh, I, my hydrogen's implied. I guess I can draw that in just to be clear. But 
but that H went right there on that N carbon. Okay, and this is what we call the one, two adduct or addition product. That's because my hydrogen got added to one carbon and my halogen got added to its next door neighbor, right? So that's the one, two adduct. Okay, so, so far, nothing too crazy, other than the fact that we're not looking for the more substituted carbon. We got that even more stable carbocation that's going to form always on the allylic position. Okay, so that's our intermediate here. But there's a reason why that allylic position is so stable, and that's because it is resonance stabilized. Okay, so I can draw a resonance structure in on this. I'm going to do so using a different color, a different color arrow. My resonance structure would be this pair of electrons jumping over here to that positive charge. So now I would have a different resonance contributor where my double bond has moved to be between carbons two and three. And it's basically sort of swapped places with that carbocation. Now my carbocation is all the way over here. Right, so because of resonance, I can have that double bond switch places with that carbocation. And now if my chloride ion goes and attacks, now I'm going to get a different product. This is what we call the 1,4 adduct. Because my hydrogen got added to this carbon over here, and then four carbons away is where my halogen is. Importantly, when we did our 1,4 adduct because of resonance, and we just are going to make a note here, we also see that that double bond moves. Right? It was between carbons 3 and 4, and now it's between carbons 2 and 3 because of that resonance shift. Okay? So we have these two possible products that we can get here for this reaction. So let's just kind of summarize this in a reaction equation here. One three butadiene reacting with HCl. We get two possible products. Again, we got fancy names for these products. We have the 1 2 addition and the 1 4 addition. So these are our two possible products from our electrophilic addition to our conjugated diene. All right, so it turns out that we can kind of tune our reaction conditions to get one of these products as our major product over the other one. It turns out that if you carry out this reaction at low temperatures,
Your major product will be that one two adduct. And your minor product will be the one four adduct. But at high temperatures, it's reverse. Your minor product is the one two, and your major product is the one four. All right, so temperature has an effect on which one of these two is going to be the major product of our reaction. All right, so what gives? How does that work out? Cool. So we need to go back and discuss what are called free energy diagrams. All right, those are these things, these graphs, where on the y-axis you have free energy. Sometimes they get lazy and just say energy. And on the x-axis you have like reaction progress or reaction coordinates. And there's this little curvy line on this plot. Look out. Something like this. Okay, these are these free energy diagrams. There are two important pieces of information that we get from this, depending on which region we look at on our free energy diagram. If we look at just the beginning, where we start and where we end, This tells us about the thermodynamics of this reaction. Right? On the left hand side is the free energy of my reactants. And on the right hand side is the free energy of my products. The difference between those here tells me about my free energy change of my reaction. So your thermodynamics are sort of telling you how stable your re products are compared to your reactants, how much lower energy your products are than your reactants. All right? The other important piece of information in this chart is the hump in the middle. This tells us about the kinetics of our reaction. Kinetics means how fast the reaction occurs. Right? The size of this, what's called activation energy barrier here, the larger that activation energy, the slower the reaction. And I guess just to be good, on the flip side here, for our thermodynamics, a large delta G is a very favorable reaction. Your products are way more stable than your reactants, right? So for delta G, a large delta G means a very favorable reaction, very stable products. I mean, I guess I should be good. A large negative delta G. We're going to worry about sign. Okay, cool. So, uh, reminder, this is these free energy diagrams. There are these two parts of our chart that we look at that give us information about our reaction, right? Where your two endpoints are, right? Those are the thermodynamics. But then the middle also tells us some information about how fast or slow that reaction is occurring. 
All right, let's bring it all back around here. We can explain this phenomena of this temperature dependence by looking at these free energy diagrams for these reactions. Okay, so again, this is our reaction. Now we're gonna build a free energy diagram. I'm actually gonna change colors. We're gonna make our one, two addict. We're gonna keep track of with a blue curve. And our one, four addict, I'm gonna keep track of with the red curve. And now we're going to make our little free energy diagram of this reaction. So again, if you could label my axis as free energy. And reaction coordinates. Okay. So for the one, two adduct, we'll put in our curve here. All right, when we draw our humps, we actually have to make this little saddle point here because we had that carbocation intermediate. Dang it. Okay. Now, if we put in our red curve here, it's going to start in the exact same place. Okay? But because of that resonance that occurs, right, we had to get, in order to get our 1, 2 addict, we had this, I'm sorry, our 1, 4 addict, we had this resonance step here. Our free energy barrier is going to be higher for that red curve. So before we even finish this off here, what can we say about the formation of that 1,4 adduct? Does it occur faster or slower than the 1,2? Slower. slower. The ba energy barrier that you got to jump over to get from reactants to products is even higher. So it's going to be a slower process. Okay? But my product that I get at the end is going to be lower in energy than my product of my 1-2 reaction. Oh, crap. Uh, so what can we say about those, our 1-4 pro product? Is it more stable or less stable than our 1-2 product? More stable. Awesome. Okay. And let's look at this structure really carefully. How can I tell by looking at this structure that it's a lower energy, that it's more stable? What is it? The degree of substitution, right? Remember the beginning, we were talking about alkene stability. Bring it all back around, right? That skill is really important, determining what is the more stable alkene. This is a secondary or a di-substituted alkene, whereas this is only a mono-substituted alkene. So definitely my 1,4 is going to sit at a lower energy. So there's this push-pull going on in these free energy diagrams. My 1, 2 forms faster, but my 1, 4 is more stable, all right? And this explains our temperature control of this reaction. We have what's called our kinetic product. Your kinetic product is the one that forms the fastest. Okay, and by forms the fastest on this bear on this chart here, what am I really talking about? What am I really looking for on my graph? The middle, the free, uh, the activation energy. I'm looking at this portion right here. So what do I mean by forms the fastest? This is the smallest activation energy. Okay. 
the kinetic product is the one that's going to be favored at low temperatures. That's because at low temperatures, your molecule doesn't have a lot of energy, all right? It's sitting over here, right? So kind of how I think about these free energy diagrams is we got this little marble here, and it's got a certain amount of energy that it needs to be able to jump over that hump here. Well, at low temperatures, this thing does not have much energy at all. So its only ability is to take that path of least resistance, and then it just kind of gets stuck here. Right? So at low temperatures, we have very little energy to overcome our activation energy barrier. Practically speaking, it's actually not so much the resonance that is the problem as much as the chloride ion at low temperatures is moving very slowly. And so it's just kind of trapped here right next to this second carbon when that first step happens. And so it eventually will uh, react with it. It doesn't kind of have enough time to migrate all the way over here. Okay. So the bottom line is our kinetic product is the one that's going to form at low energy. That's the product that will form the fastest. And again, in order to meet, uh, look at what I mean by forms the fastest on this chart, we look at the middle part, the activation energy. Okay. Importantly, what's represented in this portion of our chart is not the product of our reaction, but the intermediate, Right? what's happening in the middle here. So if I want to sort of see what's going on here, I need to look at the intermediates. All right, cool. And then on the flip side, we have what we call the thermodynamic product. This is the product that is more stable. All right, on my graph, where am I looking to see which one of my product is the most stable? Left, right, or middle? Right, all the way over here is the only thing I'm going to pay attention to when I'm talking about which product is more stable. Right, so this is the one with the lowest free energy product. So I'm not looking at my carbocation intermediate, I'm just looking at my product. All right, and again, what did we say that this was based off of in terms of our alkenes? The substitution. Lowest free energy product. That means the most substituted alkene. Or, yeah, most stable alkene. So, yes, we look at those degrees of substitution. Okay. So why is our thermodynamic, and again, and I guess just to sort of say, our thermodynamic product is our high temperature product. So why would that be the case? Well, now my little marble has a ton of energy. It's got no problem jumping over either one of these humps, all right? And so what's going to happen is it's going to kind of bounce back and forth. It gets to sample to figure out whatever it can do. It's not trapped over here like the low energy product, like the low temperature product. It can jump back over, and so it's just going to rest in what is the most low energy state that it has access to. So it samples all the different states and says, all right, I'm definitely going to pick this one over here. That's the lowest energy. So at high temperatures, we have a lot of energy
to sample all of our possible spaces, sample all of our possible products. Okay, now, importantly, in this example here, it worked out that the one, two was the low energy and the one, four was the high energy or high temperature rather. That's not always going to be the case. It's not as straightforward as that. You have to look at your structure here. For the kinetic product, it will always be a one, two. But if you had an asymmetric diene, you're still going to have to look at the intermediate and see which one is going to form the fastest. Okay, So we're still going to have to go back to these principles here. Um, in the case of a symmetric diene, it's just always the one, two. It's as simple as that. But again, if it's an asymmetric diene, you're going to have to look at which one would have the most stable intermediate, the most stable carbocation. And for the thermodynamic product, it could be either the 1, 2, or the 1, 4. You got to draw them all out and ask yourself, what is the most stable possible product of this reaction, right? What is the most substituted alkene that I could possibly get? In this case, it was the 1, 4, but it might not always be the 1, 4. You might get the 1, 2 at high and low temperatures, okay? So, uh, we didn't do all this work to just basically sum it down to always this or always that. We got to apply this sort of logic when we're doing these types of reactions here. All right. So let's just do an example of one that's going to not follow that simple pattern. Let's just do HBr, then do an HCl. Okay, so I want you to take a second and give me the 1, 2 adduct and the 1, 4 adduct for this reaction. My one, two adduct, that bromine gets added to that allylic carbon. In my one, four adduct, my double bond has moved. And so now my bromine gets added four carbons away from where that hydrogen got added. To be clear, the hydrogen got added to this guy here. You can draw that in. Okay, so again, one, two, because here's the hydrogen, here's my halogen, one, two carbons apart, one, four, 
because my hydrogen got added four carbons away from where my halogen is. And again, as we noted with our one, two adduct, I have to move my double bond as well, right? Originally, I guess if I'm just gonna keep my numbering in here. One, two adduct, that double bond stays placed between carbons three and four. But when that resonance shift occurs, it's going to move between carbons two and three, okay? And I guess just to be clear, when I say carbons one and two and whatever, uh, I'm not like putting in my numbering scheme for my naming, right? I'm not talking about my nomenclature numbering. I'm just talking about a simple kind of counting carbons to keep track of who's who here. So a one, two addict doesn't mean it's on carbon one and two when you do your nomenclature. It just means they're spaced one and two carbons apart, okay? Cool. So which one of these is going to be my kinetic product? Which one is going to form the fastest? All right, so for your kinetic product, it's always the one, two, because again, that halogen migrating over requires energy. We don't get that kind of energy. So this is my kinetic product. All right, now which one of these is my thermodynamic product? Always the one four. No, we gotta look at our two products here and ask ourselves which one is the most stable? Which one of these is gonna be the most, the lowest free energy here? Because again, at high temperatures, it can sample everything. It's gonna get to decide whether it wants to be one two or one four. It's not trapped like the kinetic product is, all right? So for here, we gotta go through and be careful. And again, when we're talking about our, uh, what can thermodynamic products, when we're talking about stability, we're talking about the more substituted alkene, right? So we're going to ask ourselves, this alkene right here, mono, di, tri, or tetra-substituted? So this one is tri-substituted. we got one, two, three carbon neighbors here. And what about this one? This one's only di-substituted. It's got one, two neighbors. So then which one of these is going to be my thermodynamic product? The one, two. The one, two is what's going to be favored at high and at low temperatures. Cool? Okay. Now for this particular one, when we talked about our kinetic product, it was pretty straightforward because this was a symmetric alkene, diene rather. There was only one product that you could get regardless of which double bond you picked to get your one, two addict. If it's an asymmetric alkene, there's a little bit more of a complication where we're gonna have to look at that intermediate, right? Because again, my kinetic product is all about that intermediate. Um, I did have an, I have an example that I'll post of working through that sort of asymmetric diene as well in case this by itself isn't enough of a clue here, all right? It follows the same logic, but I have one worked out that I'll post, all right? Uh, one more thing real quick. By low temperatures, I mean like less than zero degrees Celsius. And by high temperatures, I mean like more than 40 degrees Celsius, 40 or above. All right, so you'll see these react, you'll see actual temperatures put in in your textbook, that's, that's what I mean. That's, that's about our re range for low and high temp. Cool? All right, enjoy your weekend.